Oui, oui, oui. On est tous On pense à l'extérieur de la boîte. Je ne parlerai pas en détail de la biographie de M. Dance, puisque vous avez le lien dans l'ordre du jour à son site internet. Donc, je vous convie à aller voir, il y a plein de détails. Euh, ce que je peux dire, euh, par contre, c'est que c'est un chercheur de renommée internationale euh, du Centre national de recherche. Euh, c'est aussi un des initiateurs du mouvement des MOOC, euh, Massive euh, Online Open Courses. J'ai pris le cours, le premier cours en 2008 euh, sur le connectivisme et c'est aussi un promoteur du, du mouvement de tout ce qui est euh, l'open source. Open source. Ça, je n'en dis pas plus sur sa biographie. Uh, est-ce que je vais répéter en anglais rapidement? So, I'm not going to insist on, you know, the, the details of his career. Um, and so, because you have a biography, you have access to a biography on the site, uh, there's a link in the agenda. So, if you want to know more about Stephen, and there's a lot to learn, uh, he's done many, many things. Uh, I invite you to go. Um, I'm just going to say that he's a, a, a researcher and an international known. He's done many presentations, and that's good because I'm not saying the same thing in French and English. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, he also initiated uh, the colleague George, well, two Georges, actually, um, the, uh, the MOOC movement, uh, so the Massive Open Online Courses Movement uh, in 2008, and I took the first course on connectivism, so that's how I got to know Steve. He's also a promoter of uh, another movement, the Open uh, Source and the Open Video Movement. So, uh, all of That's all about biography. Maintenant, pourquoi est-ce que j'ai invité Steven? Ben, pas juste pour moi qui l'a invité, mais pourquoi est-ce que j'ai pensé à proposer son nom quand on a parlé d'un invité ici? Euh, il y a à peu près dix ans maintenant, j'ai participé à une conférence de deux jours à Cornwall sur le futur de l'apprentissage okay. et sur les nouvelles technologies. Steven est un présent lors de la conférence et j'ai vraiment été frappé par deux choses, sa créativité et sa facilité. C'est des choses qui sont un petit peu uh, underrated au gouvernement, mais de moins en moins. On est de plus en plus assis par ces qualités-là. C'est une chose. Et euh, on a parlé beaucoup de, 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 de se promener sur les, les paramètres de la voie. Steven, lui, ce qu'il fait, c'est qu'il agrandit la voie. Donc, il y a une voie qui la pousse. Il la pousse comment? En explorant les limites. Steven, c'est un explorateur. Et euh, on a besoin d'explorateurs, évidemment. On a besoin d'explorateurs pour nous amener à explorer notre univers. Qui a dit ça? Notre oui. univers intergalactique. Oui, oui. Euh, ben, stratégie intergalactique. Oui. On a besoin d'explorateurs. Et c'est pour ça euh, que j'ai pensé tout de suite à lui. So, I'll repeat in English now. Um, the reason why I thought of Steven, as soon as we talked about a speaker, to talk about the future of robot learning. First of all, I, um, I had the pleasure of uh, attending one of your conferences 10 years ago now, almost 10 years ago. It was at Navcan in Connolly. I don't know if you remember. I remember it clearly because there was ridiculous freezing rain. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah, yeah it's true. So, wow, you have a good memory. I'm sure that's why you can project yourself in the future very well because your memory is very great. Um, so, um, <coughs> Stephen was one of the speakers, and what I was, what really struck me about him, it's his, it's about his intelligence, but also his curiosity and his, uh, and his passion. These are two underrated qualities, or were underrated qualities. Now I think they're, they're more and more recognized as, uh, as being really key to innovation. And innovation is not about necessarily thinking outside the box, because we live in a box. It's about expanding the box. It's about exploring the edges of the box. And that's what Stephen does. He, he explores the edges of the box, so it makes it makes it bigger. It pushes the edges. Um, so he stretches the box in a sense. And, and um, yeah, that's what he does. He explores the edges. And um, that's what we need today. Uh, we need an explorer who can take us to the edges of our universe as public servants. That's why you're here to help us to guide us into our exploration. <laughs> So hello everyone, bonjour à tous, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll be speaking in English, please don't die, uh, 
Euh, je, je parle français aussi. Si vous avez des questions, je peux répondre en anglais ou français. Mais si vous parlez en français, parle un peu lent pour moi. Je suis seulement un parle anglais. Um, I'm going to talk about trends in the future of learning. That's the name of the talk. I'm not known for inventive names for my talks. Um, the objective here, um, I, I know you're doing a brainstorming exercise and all of that. My objective here is to talk about what has been happening and more importantly, what is going to happen. So it's an empirical talk. I'm not going to be saying you should do this, you should do that. I like to do that, but <laughs> I, I'm going to be resisting. So I'm going to be talking about the trends, talking about where learning is moving, not just learning, but also learning technology, and offering commentary on those trends that I think is relevant. I don't have a whole lot of time, unfortunately, uh, so it'll be a bit of a light skip through. But, uh, you know, I'm willing to drill down into any of the topics that you want um, and look more in depth at any of the technologies or any of the issues. Uh, I'm at your disposal. This is for your benefit. I am recording. Uh, I do have video of me. Hi, world. Uh, and backup audio recording. So um, if you need this video for anything later on, it'll be available. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is something we tested like a few minutes ago and it worked fine. Oh, there oh, we go. No, it's working now. So uh, I'm quoting from the invitation here. Uh, with the automation of many of the functions employees currently perform, the emphasis will switch from answering simple queries to dealing with more complex problems that will require higher levels of analysis, access to experts, and greater autonomy. Um, and I think that's true. I think we're in the middle of that. I think it's an incredible challenge to an organization like government, especially you know, higher levels of analysis, and greater autonomy is a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge both from a policy perspective. It's also a challenge from a management and training perspective. So what I've been asked to look at is how the college can equip itself for what's coming, uh, what form is learning going to take, and especially training, operational training, in the next 10, 15 years. Uh, time frame's always going to be a bit vague. Uh, I like to say the future takes far longer than you think it's going to take, and then it happens all of a sudden. Uh, and that's, that's been my experience over the years. I want to look at what's learning, what learning is going to become first before talking about any of the actual tech. Uh, I, there's more screens here than there are people. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, although this is far from the most unusual venue. I've, I've given talks in, I gave a talk in North Bay in an airline hangar once. That was pretty wild. Um, I gave a talk in a completely pitch black planetarium once. That was kind of weird. That was one of the efforts I, I made to video my talks. That's what like, you have to shadow. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I could I could approach this question a dozen different ways, right? Uh, I've chosen these because these are themes that I come across quite a bit. Um, what will learning become relevant, engaging, and personal? Again, picking those kind of out of the air. But as we drill down, you'll see how they characterize learning. So let's look at relevant. Um, relevant is probably the most important and possibly the most frequently discussed of the new directions in which learning will take. One of the things we hear a lot, anytime, any place, uh, but also things like ubiquitous learning. That is, learning that's available anywhere. Um, uh, an environment in which you're surrounded by possibilities for learning. Another one that's very important is context to where, um, and I only mentioned, I don't actually have another slide for this problem focus. That's a really important one. 
Uh, when we get to talking about personal learning, I'm going to come back to problem focused. So I have a few, not that many, but I have a few cases scattered through the presentation. Um, one case is mobile learning and mobile support. And this is a case for the idea of any time, any place learning. And these are four trends, I think, that are already present out there in the world and becoming increasingly present in the workplace. Access, for example, learning as you go with different devices. So, for example, for me coming to this building, I would not have any issue accessing learning. I'd be able to access it with my own computer, with my phone, with your computers, whatever. The device, again, this, well, maybe not that device, but your, your tablet, uh, your laptop, in theory, BlackBerry, um, etc. That's a government joke. <laughs> uh, location is a hard one. Uh, location, the idea that you can learn not just in your office, not just in your home, but when you're out in the field. Um, we did work in corporate learning a number of years ago, and that's a big one for them. The you know, oil field, for example, going out, you need to learn how to fix a pump when you're standing there in minus 30 degrees at the pump. Mm -hmm. uh, it's tricky. Um, design, and this is the idea of designing for all of these modalities. And we're going to see learning design for all of these modalities. What that tends to, we need to be careful when we think about that. We tend to think of, we'll design it once and design it so it runs on mobile and runs on the desktop. And, but our experience is people use different devices for different things. Um, you wouldn't take a course off your mobile phone. At least I wouldn't because that would be crazy. <laughs> um, right? You're probably going to take a course off of this. You might use this for a quick back and forth call to a mentor, a support agent, desk help, something like that. So different technology for different devices, I think, is probably going to be the rule. And we need to keep that in mind. Another case talking about uh, relevance is content recommendations. And every time I'm working with a group, this is almost one of the first things that comes up. This has been the story in online learning since the 1990s, and probably before, but they couldn't imagine it in different ways. Um, I like to say that learning is not a search problem. Uh, search helps, right? And so finding the right resource using different mechanisms such as collaborative fielding, filtering, cognitive modeling, etc. That's a thing. And that's an important thing that's going to be happening, especially over the next few years with data analytics, etc. Uh, but resource recommendation is only a part of the picture. And in my mind, a small part of the picture. And, and I say that because if you go over to the engineers, they're going to want to build you a recommender system. Um, and the, the pushback has to be, no, there's more to learning than just getting the right resources in the right place. Engaging. I want to linger on engaging a little bit. Engaging means immersive and engaging means wanted. Um, we have to want to be there and we have to believe that we're there. I have, a, I have and it's interesting given the, uh, the video we just saw, uh, immersive is a state of belief rather more than anything else. Immersive is if we think we're there, we're there. If we think there's a person at the other end, there's a person at the other end. It's, it's not a metaphysical state. It's not a technological state. Um, a conversation can be immersive. A telephone call can be immersive. A 3D virtual environment can be immersive, or they can all not be immersive. It's all based on state of belief. And that has a lot to do with intention. Slack, Airtable, Trello, these are conferencing systems. I consider these to be as much immersive as the VR, etc., on the right hand side of the screen there. What makes them immersive? You really get this sense of presence, of person at the other end. Slack, for example, when they designed Slack, they made it colorful, they made it bouncy, they made it fun, 
all of that was to make it more immersive. Presence is the idea that there's a person at the other end of the interaction. The presence of the person is what makes us believe. And presence is becoming more and more important, not just in learning, but in technology generally. There's a history of the study of presence in online learning. I refer to Terry Anderson, Randy Garrison, etc. And the idea here is that we're social, we're thinking together, uh, somebody's there to help us, somebody's there to support us, etc. Uh, it can also be negative. Uh, you can have, you know, negative presence online. People are there to take you down, to insult you, trolls, bullies, etc. Mm -hmm. So it works both ways. It's not unequivocally a positive, but it's necessary. Affordances are wanted. Technology that's wanted can be described in terms of affordances. When you think of wanted, what do you think of? You think of personal, spontaneous, informal, etc. Uh, you think of things that are fun, you know, let's look at some of these things here, uh, <laughs> right here, fun, 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 fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are all ways of expressing the affordances of the technology, that is, what the technology is capable of allowing you to do. This is an important theme. Uh, we, we tend to think of technology especially from a design perspective in terms of things like use cases or desired outcomes or things like that. Uh, people very rarely use technology in that way though. Think about it this way. We have the internet, trillions of dollars worth of technology. What do we use it for? Sending cat pictures to our friends, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> But that's what makes it wanted, right? Yeah, it's a really useful business and training tool. But who would be using it if you couldn't send cat pictures? Right? Um, so it's not all about the end goal and the outcome. And we'll, we'll hit that theme a few times in the, few, in the remainder of this presentation. I'm really conscious of the time. This is so short. Personal technology will be personal, will be more personal. Um, I've created this diagram to try to explain the difference between personalized, which we hear all the time, and personal. There is a big trend toward personalized. I'm going to hit it again later on. But personal is also a big trend. It's more under the radar. But if you think, look at the distinction personal defines a desired state rather than an ideal state. A desired state is typically in terms of you're able to solve a problem, you're able to accomplish a task, you're able to get something done, as opposed to an ideal state which describes, say, a state of learning, a competence acquired, a position attained, etc. Uh, the mechanism is different as well. When you're trying to get something done, usually your first instinct is to try to get it done. And this sets you into an iterative practice kind of approach. As opposed to when you're defining an ideal state, you try to get all of the content in your mind first, and then you try something else. Maybe you take a test, maybe you try to apply it, you do knowledge transfer, knowledge translation, etc. The desired state is an iterative loop. You try, you see where you went wrong, you get feedback, you improve. <clears throat> the content state is you try, you test it, there's a gap in your performance which must be filled and corrected. You see the different attitudes, right? So, and the role and this, this reflects the changing role of instructors online. Historically, the role of the instructor has been to present content, to impose requirements, to test for success. This is changing. And it's changing to something like offering support, helping, providing resources, creating affordances, and being a support for the person who's learning. And even, I say sometimes, an advocate for the person who's learning. This is a trend. That, doesn't mean it's irreversible. And I, we actually find this division in a lot of the technological implementations we see. Um, for example, on the left, 
Saba, or Desire to Learn, or your, your corporate learning management system. On the right, social media, instant messaging. Um, uh, well, that's enough. <laughs> you get the idea. So, there's also a lot of talk about competencies. Uh, the distinction that I've just drawn is the distinction between competencies and support. And this, as you can see from the diagram, it's not a simple left, right, off, on kind of distinction. There's a range of different approaches and different possibilities. Overall, though, in that diagram, we're moving from left to right. We're moving from managing and training more toward mentoring and counseling. Um, we have a case here, for example, of the personal learning plan. Uh, on the right-hand side is a bunch of uh, applications that allow people to design their own learning plan uh, and, and then measure their success towards reaching that learning plan. I'm not big on those, but what I do like, and it's on here, I don't have time to open it up, is RunKeeper. Uh, RunKeeper, believe it or not, I exercise. Um, and actually, I cycle quite a bit. And what RunKeeper allows me to do is measure my cycling. So I set my target for the year, and then it tracks me as I cycle through the year and shows my progress toward that goal. It's a fairly simple thing, but it's a plan. It's a personal training plan. It's actually quite successful. I cycle a lot more than you might think. Um, it's the whole idea as well, this distinction between personal and personalized practice versus presentation. Practice is the personal approach. Practice is the idea of iterations. Um, and it's interesting when we look at what management is looking for uh, in surveys that have been done, they come back and they say, don't tell me, show me. Show me how to th think strategically with examples of it, right? Show me how to reframe an issue. Show me how to deal with the ambiguity of the world, etc. Rather than just tell you what should be done. Okay, that was a quick hop, skip, and a jump, and it still took too long. Uh, how do we provide these? Uh, the learning resources, environments, and assessment. Again, this is an arbitrary division. Um, but this arbitrary division uh, allows us to identify a range of different technologies. Learning resources are in the process of changing four major categories, open educational resources, data books, personalized learning, and performance support. We think of learning resources traditionally as videos, presentations, text, uh, maybe a little multimedia if we're lucky, maybe a game if we're really lucky. Um, but learning resources are transforming dramatically. They're in this process now, um, and it will have taken a hold probably within five years or so. One thing that's changing a lot is openness. They are becoming open. By that, what I mean is that a resource created in one place for one purpose is made accessible to a wide number of potential users. Uh, people talk about open licensing, that's a part of it. Open technology, that's a part of it. Open source, that's a part of it. The idea, though, is that uh, rather than thought of as proprietary, uh, they're being thought of as shareable. Again, whole huge talks on that. Learning is also becoming personalized. I mentioned this a bit earlier. Um, that's more, I mean, there's, there's different ways of thinking of personalized. Now, I want to be careful here. Um, a lot of times people just think of personalized as, okay, now you're just working on your own, whereas before you were listening to a, a talk by a group. But that's not so much it. It's partially a, a lot of it has to do with content recommendation. A lot of it has to do with learning path. But personalized learning is also about personal goals, personal objectives. Uh, personalized learning, as it's used in the field right now, 
has a lot to do with matching competencies to people. Um, and then competencies to that person's learning objectives. I'm a little skeptical. Um, okay, I'm a lot skeptical. And uh, I have several reasons for it, but mostly it's because, first of all, it's based on defining an ideal state about which nobody agrees. I mean, that's empirical fact. Um, secondly, it's based on a semantical approach, the perspective that we can break down learning or break down the desired outcomes of learning into sets of competencies. This is a semantic exercise. We're trying to identify phenomena and name them and then use those names in order to construct some sort of uh, algorithm or I don't want to say artificial intelligence, it's a bit too much, but you know, mechanism so that we can you know, track a competency from uh, job requirement to training need to training resource to assessment, right? And the idea is that the competency would form a single common thread all through that. A lot of people are spending a lot of money on this, but is the competency the locus of the thread? And I'm not sure that it is, and I have reason to believe that it isn't. Um, so, so, what's the alternative? So, the alternative, um, well, in, in one word, the alternative is recognition rather than competencies. Competencies is the idea of breaking an ability or a skill down into a number of components and then evaluating for those components, teaching for and evaluating those components. But that's not, in fact, how we teach often. It's not, in fact, how we uh, assess. We teach often in a more holistic fashion. I, I know I'm waving my hands around here, but I have to, given the time. Um, we would show an entire performance of, say, neurosurgery, or, say, customer service, or, say, uh, repairing a pump. And we wouldn't try to say, you know, uh, there's the, uh, the smiling part and the answering part. Um, the performance as a whole is what we try to model. And again, in the assessment, it's the performance as a whole as, a, as opposed to the performance on the individual pieces. So the form of the assessment takes the form of a recognition of overall performance by a uh, typically somebody who's already an expert, rather than a testing of specific parts of the performance. Classic example, internship in a hospital. Um, we don't just give doctors a test or, you know, test them for individual competencies. We look at, we put them in a hospital, observe their entire performance, uh, you know, an existing doctor observes their entire performance on the basis of that entire performance says, whether or not they're a doctor. The functional mechanism in this case is similar to the functional mechanism you would use if your grandmother was coming through the bus terminal. You don't look for properties of your grandmother. Right? You don't look for the gray hair, the red scarf, the blue shoes, uh, the, the, the poodle. Uh, <laughs> um, you watch all the people and then instantly you recognize your grandmother because you know what's your grandmother. You know that's an instance of my grandmother, right? That's an instance of a doctor. That's a doctor. That's not. How do you know? You see what I mean? I totally see what you mean. Like I, I the education of it is good. I didn't say it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> but but this having just drawn that distinction, this is the distinction between the way artificial intelligence has worked in the past, semantic web, ontologies and all of that, and the way artificial intelligence is working in the future with neural nets, deep learning. There's a session over there, learning machines. They're talking about machines that learn. They're talking about neural net technology. Neural net technology is a recognition kind of technology, usually, as opposed to uh, a semantically based technology. I'm going to skip the different types of student inquiry, but there are different types of student inquiry. 
because um, I want to get to this point, <laughs> and, and this point's important. Our typical learning resources, like I said earlier, text videos and things like that, are in the process of transforming into dynamic learning resources. Uh, this is an example here of uh, Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook, which is a type of notebook where you can have some text and then there's a cell in which you can have some computer code and another cell in which you see the output of that code. And the neat thing about a Jupyter Notebook is you can change the code in the cell and that changes the, out the, the output of the code in real time. What's interesting about a Jupyter Notebook is typically you have your notebook, you have your code. That code is accessing uh, a source of data from a third party, a live source of data from a third party. So uh, maybe it's a Jupyter Notebook on uh, employment statistics and we're running a calculation based on employment statistics. Here's my algorithm. I can tweak a few characters and get a different chart or whatever. Uh, but the chart or whatever is going to be based on this month's statistics. And then next month, because it's coming from live data, it will be based on next month's statistics. So your textbook is changeable, manageable, but always live. Um, there's a, a project being run by instructional IMS Global instructional management systems called Actional Data Books, and that's a broader generalization of the same trend. We're going to see this a lot more in learning, learning that is connected to these resources. And then if you think about combining the first two things, open educational resources and open data, now you have things like these notebooks that can be shared. So a notebook created for use in one department can be distributed to other departments for their own use. Performance support, you're probably all very familiar with performance support, uh, EPSS systems, etc. The point I want to make here is that performance support is going to travel with the, uh, the person. It will always be available. This is a tennis racket. I love this tennis racket because it teaches you how to play tennis. Um, it has feedback mechanisms inside the handle so it knows you know, how you swung it. Uh, it connects using Bluetooth, that's a little blue there, uh, with your uh, local device. And uh, you know, if, it was, if, it, if I designed it, you know, it's reacting like, oh, you've never played tennis, have you? Or <laughs> perhaps golf is your game. <laughs> um, but the thing is, it, it, it's, 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 it's incorporating a, cu a few key things, right? It's data-driven. Um, but it's personal data driven and the data doesn't even have to leave the environment of the tennis racket and the, uh, the mobile phone. So you don't need a big centralized system for this to work. You, you just need local data, local data exchange. This is, so it's an example not just of performance support but of personal performance support and I think this sort of thing is going to become more important as time goes by. People talk about and have talked a lot in the last year about artificial intelligence replacing humans. Uh, the standard response, which is to a large degree correct, is that artificial intelligence will augment humans, and, and we're seeing that now. That's my pace, my, my career on using the computer to give myself an advantage over my competitors. I'm not that smart, really. Um, and, and that's what's going to happen in the future. Um, you know, another way of putting it is, you know, people with the best tools will win. It's not quite accurate, but, you know, uh, think of simple everyday examples now. Driving in through the parking lot we call Ottawa traffic, right, people mm -hmm. can use uh, a GPS to map the best route. Uh, as these get better, these GPSs will actually connect with city traffic and they'll self-organize the traffic so that nobody's caught in the red spot. Um, that would be kind of cool, actually. And that's a case of um, you know, augmenting our decision-making with intelligent support. I just made that up now. So, uh, maybe <laughs> <it's> a, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the sort of thinking. But right? then more people will take their car. 
<laughs> no, it would, it would be self-organized. It would be self-organized. Some won't start. At that moment, the singer was telling you about saying that while we go to work, we can go pick Madame Trondé at that street. And then that's pretty good. <laughs> Everybody will be involuntary Uber drivers. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good point. It's, you know, none of this, none of this technology is 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 neutral, right? I mean, uh, people say, you know, the people say technology is neutral. The ethics is in the person that uses the technology. It's not necessarily true. Um, and uh, with any of these, we need to be looking at. You know the possible implications like that. The next bit is learning environments. Now I'm running over the time I was allocated, so uh, no. okay. No, 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 no. All right. Okay. Well, I just wanted to do a check because <laughs> you passed, so you're good. So, I, I have had that hook come out. You know, so. <laughs> Not because they don't. It's just anyhow. All right. So. Uh, I'm focusing on five major aspects of learning environments. I picked the term learning environments maybe a bit disingenuously because I think every every environment is a learning environment. I mean, we talked earlier about learning being ubiquitous. If learning is ubiquitous, then literally every, and by definition, every environment is a learning environment. But learning environments, of course, also comes has come to mean you know the, the technological and social infrastructure that supports learning. Learning platforms. Um, the the key thing that's happening here is that especially in larger enterprise systems, the technology is moving away from the I, the idea of a one system does everything for you to the idea of there is a central system, but that central system accesses external resources in order to do what it does for you. Um, what I've put up there is uh, a little diagram illustrating something called LTI. Uh, that's an IMS specification, stands for Learning Tools Interoperability. And basically what it does is it allows your learning management system to launch an external application like a discussion board, chat room, uh, streaming media, whatever. And it's, it doesn't, it's not just a launcher though. It allows the new application to communicate back with the learning management system. So, you know, the very simple things is, uh, simple thing, uh, simple things are, um, I started. I played the video. Now I'm done. So that's useful for an LMS to know, right? And then once the video is done, you can move on to the next thing. Um, longer term, you can think of uh, exchanges of data. Here are the results of the test, for example. Here are the names of the people that the person talks to, um, as well as things like. Uh, roles. Uh, I want you to enter this external application as such and such a role. If we use advanced uh, learning design such as the IMS learning design specification, a learning resource is defined as multi-user where the multiple users will have different roles. So you can have uh, something launched by the learning management system involving three or four people each of them with a different role in that interaction, whatever it happens to be. And then if it's all been implemented correctly, it'll send feedback back to the LMS. You notice how I say, if it's all been implemented correctly. Uh, it's not like these things are plug and play. Uh, they require a fair amount of configuration and the specifications do not apply equally or evenly across all learning management systems. So it's not turnkey, but that's the idea and the potential of the technology. Uh, I'll give you a case. Um, this is uh, from the Canada School of Public Service. They built a thing called GC Campus. Now, GC Campus does not actually employ LTI, uh, but it does employ a large LMS, a SABA system. And the Sabbath system 
is connected with what's called an enterprise bus, uh, which is basically a transfer route to a set of external applications. And in particular, they have an installation of Moodle, an installation of Drupal, which they use for a database, uh, an installation of Kaltura, uh, which is uh, a video hosting service. Um, I think they have one or two other things, but th those are the main things that they have. What they've done is you sign into the learning management system. The learning management system registers the individual's identity, and then that identity is preserved across all of these other systems. Now, the data isn't all rationalized yet. So the, the Drupal data is separate from the Kaltura data, etc. But you can see the beginnings of this, right? You can see how they wanted to do more than Saba could do. They wanted to be, uh, they wanted it, you know, be able, they wanted to be able to support more agile, more lightweight tools, but not lose the registration capacities of the learning management system, registration and management capacities of the LMS. <coughs> Internet of Things also plays a role in learning environments. Uh, you might not think, but in ubiquitous, right? Um, so a couple of simple examples here. Um, of course, we have things like uh, virtual, how do, how do I want to say it? Well, it's Grand Theft Auto Mod. <laughs> um, but basically, it's modifications to existing technology that help you see in 3D. If we're thinking of things like augmented reality, uh, again, we're talking about driving our cars with the support of uh, AI. Uh, again, you shouldn't be looking down at your phone to use your AI to pick your route. Really, it should show right up on your screen or in your glasses or something like that. Um, other uses as well. On the lower left, there is what's called the magic band or magic band. Uh, again, good, bad, I don't know. It's a bracelet that Disney hands out, especially to kids when they go to Disneyland or Disney World, tracks where they go, tracks what they buy. Um, now, it's handy because you don't have to stand in line for the rides anymore, which is the main activity at Disneyland and Disney World. Um, you can use your magic band to say, I want to ride on such and such a ride, and when it's your turn, it'll vibrate, and you go to have your ride. I think that's a great thing. Uh, but it tracks you around. And it, it tracks children around. And how is that not creepy? Uh, so, you know, um, other things uh, on the right there is is uh, just an example of an application where you can take a picture of a landmark. In this case, I forget what it's called, but it's the Great Big Atom in Brussels. I think they just call it the Great Big Atom. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, but it, it, it can access facts and figures, the website, etc. Uh, you know, so it's it's an augmented reality presence. Um, again, there's a, a lot of potential for Internet of Things, but the, the key thing here from the perspective of our presentation is things now become learning agents. Do I want to call them that? Things can teach you now. Um, so Remember setting up this camera and all of that. That camera should contain instructions, and those instructions should play right here. And that they they should actually be um, instructions in my language, um, maybe audio instructions if I like it that way, or pictures of how it should be put together, and 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 it should be able to, to detect what's not working and tell you what you need to do to fix it. Those sorts of things. Your chair, these chairs, I tell you. These chairs should teach us how to operate them. Because I don't know how to operate them, which means I'm always sitting too low. Um, Etc. Right? You know, um, and of course, uh, dashboards, uh, panels, etc. All of these should contain and will contain learning right in them. But interesting, learning that is dynamically sourced, because. If you have the original instructions from the panel that was installed in 1963, it's probably not going to be helpful. Things, you know, there's 50 years of experience using that panel that has been accumulated over the years. And what one of those pieces of 
of experiences, hit it just so, point, and that'll set the needle properly. Right? That'll never be in the official manual. Um, but it is a piece of knowledge acquired over time if something like that is a live data stream that is accessible as part of your learning when you're at that panel, then that supports your learning about that panel. There's a bunch of cases I could have thrown in there. One of my favorite is um, Company Commander. It's old now. It's a Drupal-based system. Remember, I talked about Drupal as a, as a content management system. Company commanders in the U.S. Army simply exchanging stories, information, uh, and experiences with each other. You know, this road's a bad road. Uh, you know, this kind of house typically does it. You know, I don't know. I didn't read it because they won't let me. But, um, but you know, practical field level advice at the level of company commanders, and it's not vetted. It's not. Um, you know, officially sourced or anything like that. It's just an exchange. It's the kind of thing you would have around the water cooler if you had a water cooler in Afghanistan. So, and that leads us to social learning. And social learning, there's, there's several aspects to this. Um, social learning is becoming more virtual and it's becoming more social and it's becoming more accessible. We messed around with WebEx here, uh, it, but compared to even the way it was 10 years ago, even the way it was five years ago, this, this worked really well, um, even if it didn't work. It worked really well, comparatively. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you, look at, you, know, you look at the guy with the earbud in his ear, that's a thing from Google. Um, Google had to justify not having a microphone jack on their new uh, Pixel phones. I think that's a terrible thing for them to have done. But So what they've done is they've put uh, automated language translation into the earbuds. The idea is that you're listening to your earbuds, your phone is listening to the other person speaking, and gives you a real-time automated, automated translation. Now, is it ready for prime time? No. <laughs> You'd be stupid to rely on it. Is it going to get worse than it is now, though? No. I mean, it can only get better. Um, and so you should all, you know, I'm talking here a mile a minute in English. Uh, you should all have access to your own personal earbuds that will pick up what I say and repeat it to you in the language of your choice. And ideally, any language of your choice. So social learning is, you know, we, we think of social learning as online. Um, but social learning is, as we were demonstrating right here, also in person. But augmented, augmented with automated translation, augmented with easy graphics. I do talks a lot of the time with a back channel, so there's, you all have a screen on which you share messages with each other. Um, things like that. So even the imper even the personal is becoming more social. Uh, LTI API JSON, which is a little bit of alphabet soup. But what I want to emphasize with this slide, and I won't linger on it too long, is all the the technology for connecting all of this stuff is becoming more sophisticated and more reliable every day. Uh, back in 1998, I worked for something called RSS, uh, Rich Site Summary, or Really Simple Syndication, which was really good for sharing the contents of websites. Now we're using things like LTI, which I mentioned earlier, Learning Tools Interoperability, API, which stands for Application Programming Interface, so one computer program can talk to another computer program. Uh, and JSON is very often the language that they use to talk to each other. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and it's just a simple way of representing structured data. So you can send structured data from your program to my program in a hurry. One of the things that JSON does, for example, is it allows me from my website to automatically send a tweet to Twitter. Now, I, I 
send OL daily tweets. That's my newsletter. I send out five or six tweets to to Twitter every day. I don't go type them. My computer system, my program, automatically contacts Twitter, sends a JSON message to Twitter, and Twitter posts the uh, contents of the message. And I go, hey, great, because now I can do that with Facebook, I can do that with Google+, I can do that with whatever, right? I can, I can do the same thing, send a text to my grandma. She, she won't know it was sent automatically. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> Um, so, as time, you know, the, the CSPS used this fairly heavy enterprise bus, but as time goes by, we're going to see, and we are seeing, a web of interconnected applications using these kinds of technologies. Um, so, here's the case, and this is the case that I was actually looking at with CSPS, resource integration. How do we integrate the different parts of the learning infrastructure. Do we just put tabs on it so I can go, you know, click on a button in my learning management system and go to Drupal? It's one way. Single sign-on. The most demanded thing of everyone is single sign-on. Uh, common services is my service one among many others. Extending the bus, uh, LTI again, or full integration. Uh, in, a, in a presentation I did the other day, there was a whole discussion of applications running inside other applications. And that leads us to cloud applications. I hope it's a time issue and not an editorial comment. <laughs> <laughs> and he probably knows all this stuff, anyways. Um, um, more and more. All of this stuff is being done in the cloud, which is a fancy way of saying on someone else's computer. Um, but <laughs> what's really important here uh, is not the fact that it's in the cloud. Um, although, you know, it's on Amazon Web Services or it's on Google Web Services or whatever they call it these days or Microsoft, uh, IBM. Blue Sphere or something like that. I have accounts on all these. I never remember their names, but it doesn't matter what the names are because it's just branding. The really important thing is an application or even an entire computer can be represented virtually as a digital object. And then that object can be placed anywhere. And in fact, I built some. I, my software that I talked about, I built it as a digital object and ran it on another computer. I went to a conference just last week, and I gave the people in, in the workshop copies of my computer. And then they ran them on their computers. And so within about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, we had you know, five copies of my computer running on their computers. Um, that's where learning resources are going in the future. We think of a learning resource Again, as text or video or whatever, but think of an entire computer potentially being a learning resource. And then think of these computers talking and interoperating with each other on an as needed basis. 15 years from now, that will be the norm. That's what it'll be. Uh, because all of this stuff is happening now. If you hear about Amazon, everybody talks about Amazon, the store. Amazon, the data provider, is a much bigger enterprise. It's a much bigger part of their business. Um, similarly, uh, Google has spent all this time providing free services. But in the back end, they're building all of these cloud resources that you actually pay to, uh, to access. And if, you, if you're a Google Drive user, you've just re seen recently Google rearrange all their services. So now there's a personal and a commercial layer. They did that just in the last three months. Um, you will pay for the commercial layer. Personal layer is still free, but the use of the personal layer is to access the commercial layer. So, um, so but like it's free. It's not free. You're giving your life away to them. Yeah, it's not free. It's never free. <laughs> uh, or as the saying goes, right? If it's free, 
you are the product. Yeah. Um, so, but it's a trade-off, right? Um, just like all of these things are trade-offs. Um, you know, we use the roads. The roads are free. Um, but here's a trade-off. We have to pay our taxes for them. Um, make magic money come out of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, the other side of this, too, is this was all, you know, this is, in a sense, this is all old technology. It's been around for a few years. Um, when the first uh, commercial MOOCs came on stream in 2012, they used Docker, which is a virtualization technology, and they put their course on Amazon Web Service. And they used Docker and put it in the cloud because when they got 150,000 people, they could scale it up really easily. But now, as I speak, this technology is on the verge of becoming accessible and available to individual people, which means we will use the clouds just like an application provider. We already do. Um, if you have iCloud, if you use Apple, I don't know if BlackBerry has a cloud. <laughs> it's probably there, but nobody can access it. Uh, <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, but if you store your photos on iCloud or Google Photos or whatever you're using the cloud, if you use Dropbox, you're using the cloud. And more and more of our stuff will go into the cloud. Um, one thing, and I think it's in the slide in a little bit, our personal learning records. Right? Where else would we put our personal learning records but in the cloud so that now we can make this as live data available to these new learning resources that are actually computers using data streams. Um, privacy implications? Oh yeah, all over the place, right? But look at what we're doing now, right? Right now, all of our learning data goes into large enterprise management systems. We don't have access to any of it without their permission, and who knows what they're doing to it. Um, in, in our particular case, government enterprise, we're probably okay, um, insofar as large centralized services are okay. Uh, but you know, once we get out into the commercial world and more commercial providers, you know, if Facebook offers a learning service, what are they doing with the data? Microsoft actually does offer a learning service. Microsoft owns LinkedIn, which is a social network, and LinkedIn knows, owns this thing called Linda, um, which is, again, uh, a learning service that has all of your data. We like Linda. <laughs> Assessment. So we talked a bit about assessment earlier. Um, the big trend is competencies and skills. I mentioned some of my doubts about it, um, but I do, you know, for the sake of completeness, uh, it's important that I, I mention a project that's being run by Advanced Distributed Learning in the United States with the cooperation of companies, other organizations like IEEE, uh, Learning Technology Standards Committee, etc. Um, overall, it's called Total Learning Architecture, which sounds like Skynet to me. But, um, part of it is something called Competencies and Skills Systems, CASS, and that's uh, a diagram from their documentation. You can see the idea is the competency is a bunch of blank boxes, or sorry, uh, the competency system is a bunch of blank boxes, each one of those representing a competency, and then the actual student record being the, uh, the color, you know, their success or failure, as in the case of the red, in a given competency. Um, there's a lot of issues with assessment of competencies and assessment generally. Um, and I think right now there is, and as long as there is, uh, it'll be a problem, a disconnect between accurate assessment and motivation for uh, honest academic behavior. Um, you know, there, there, there isn't an inherent benefit to behaving in an academically honest manner. 
I hate to say it, but it's true. There's, there's, you know, the only downside happens is if you're caught. Um, but if you're not caught from the perspective of the person, there's nothing but upside. Um, it's interestingly the same kind of problem that happens or that exists with authentication. Um, what is the incentive for you to keep your password to the New York Times website a secret? Well, there is none. Why would you do that? Uh, you, know, you have an account you're paying $15 a month for. Why not share it with everybody in their dog? Um, same with your Netflix accounts, etc. So I, that's why, that's part of the reason why I think that assessment is going to be tied with actual performance, and actual performance will be evaluated based on, recommend, or on recognition, um, and that this recognition will be derived in part through artificial intelligence and in part through social networks. Your academic honesty, honesty will be vetted by and motivated by your social network. Long story there. Uh, competencies and skill systems I mentioned. Here's another representation of the same thing uh, in more detail and some of the uh, purposes to which it will be put. Workforce planning, recruiting, onboarding, etc. Somebody mentioned that the exercise here goes well beyond learning. That's been my experience with all of this stuff. We're doing a project at NRC with TBS called Micro Missions, which ties competencies to uh, short-term part-time employment elsewhere in the civil service, for example. Um, we're also doing, well, I'm not going to list a whole bunch of examples here, but that is the case. It's more than just learning. This technology is the core to a range of knowledge-based services and products, uh, compensation, career and succession planning, etc. cetera. Uh, people talk about blockchain a lot. Um, I'm not going to describe blockchain because I'm given, being given the big hook. <laughs> um, but the short version is it's a way of encrypting your student records. And quantified self that's the runkeeper story, right? That's the using all of this data to measure and manage our own personal performance. And finally, last slide, uh, is the idea of feed forward. I wish I could talk for another hour on this. Um, our performance is what is being assessed, but our performance is also what becomes the learning resource for the future. I'm doing this talk now. This talk is part of my performance. I'm doing my duties as you know, an officer of NRC. But it's now a learning resource that other people will look at and study and share and draw mustaches on or whatever. right? And, and that's the case across the board. Our traditional conception of learning is expert comes in and teaches, people learn from the expert. The future model of learning is People do stuff and share information as they do stuff. Other people observe that and learn from that. So people learn from each other. There's a range of literature about this, but I think we're moving more and more away from professional instructors and more and more toward, I don't want to call it peer learning. It's not quite the right connotation, but people learning from each other in a community social network, learning network, etc. You can read more. There's a report um, that I did for Contact North that came out a month and a half ago. There's a lot more uh, to talk about. And that's me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Um, and thinking about sort of the exercise that took place earlier this morning about thinking about how things will be sometime in the future. Um, you know, we all know that our organizations are changing. And all departmental <coughs> organizations are, are, are trying to transform the way it does its business. In thinking about how we transform learning in a setting such as ours, you know, there are, you know, Setting aside, setting aside competency learning 
can you identify some leaders in, who are transforming learning in a setting that is comparable to some of our regulatory type organizations in the federal government? So for example, it's nice to think about peer learning or you know a shift in the way um, people will engage in learning in organizations. And definitely we are moving there. But when there are very specific types of behaviors or decision making that are expected that won't be automated, how are people transforming learning in those types of settings? Um, and where would you point us to, to look at as examples of these? Oh, um, the first place I would point you, believe it or not, is the armed forces. Uh, we've done work with uh, the combat training school in Gagetown, for example. Um, a lot of their work is based on, you know, well, you know, they have a lot of mission critical stuff, but a lot of their training is designed to push the decision making to lower and lower levels because it's the only way to, to wage the new kind of asymmetric warfare. Right? You can't manage from the central office. So you have to develop these kinds of peer-to-peer -peer and social learning networks so that people who are on the ground in a situation can rapidly communicate with each other. So that's one place. And yet still they, do, they still all do basic training. They still all do basic training, it's, yeah. But it's the evolution beyond that jump, yeah. to that, that, that jump off point. Yeah. But keep in mind, basic training is what, six weeks of a 20-year career, right? So, you know, that's the, I mean, I run, but I run into that argument a lot, right? Yeah, you have to have the foundations, right? And my, my response is, yeah, but you can cover these foundations really quickly. Um, and, and, and it's interesting, the stuff that they do in basic training, it actually never stops after. It's mostly about teaching them to do that, right? Like, you know, a big part of basic training is you need to be physically fit, right? So you don't just train physically for six weeks and you're like, I'm fit now. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it creates habits and regimens that continue for a lifetime. Uh, people are talking more about teaching people how to learn. And, you know, so it's almost like basic mental fitness training. And, and that's the sort of thing that should happen early in a career, early in a life. And right now, well, I shouldn't say right now. In the past, it hasn't. Our education system, our school system is moving in that direction, for which they are, of course, criticized for being too progressive and not focusing on knowledge, but um, teaching people how to learn, how to, how to predict, uh, you know, anticipate consequences, how to do basic inferences, etc., how to describe what they've seen. Um, th these are core skills. And that makes a very strong argument for learning paths that look beyond initial onboarding related training and really explore, you know, much further into the, uh, the future of, you know, of yeah. our workforce. Because if we want to engage in more social learning and, and in different learning methodologies, we really have to start early oh, yeah. in our in our sort of interaction as as employees yeah. with the learning in our work in our career, not necessarily our workplace or our work function, but in our career. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, it's a personal example, so I know it's accurate. <laughs> uh, I uh, one of the things I started doing. I, I used to live in Ottawa but there were no jobs. Uh, so I moved to Calgary and got a job in a computer company, which was a subsidiary of Texas Instruments, and they sent me to Austin, Texas for training, uh, which was great. <laughs> um, but uh, part of the training I did, it was extracurricular, although that was probably a mistake on their part, was a series of video lectures. This is in 1981. A uh, series of video lectures called On the Way Up. Probably a bad name, too. But it was all about communications strategies. I learned so much from that series of videos. Uh, I learned about active listening. Who knew? 
<laughs> Who knew you could actually practice listening and, and indicate that you would understood? Uh, I learned about a communications technique called feel, want, willing. All right, uh, here's how this makes me feel. Here's what I want to resolve the problem. Here's what I'm willing to do to reach a solution. That's simple. But you know, when you're 18 years old and you've come out of school and they didn't teach you any of that, it's invaluable. Um, and as you can see, it's never left me. Uh, although some people said that the listening part didn't take. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, hitting people with, you know, the, the really basics, the fundamentals that they're going to need to be successful. And, and my feeling is that they want this too. Um, they, they want the skills to succeed in, in their work environment. But it sounds like the reframing that needs to take place is much more so in our management culture and our preconceived um, frameworks for learning. Because in order to be able to restructure and reconsider the way individuals learn at work, we can talk about informal learning, we can talk about a lot of you know, a lot of different concepts, but at the base management and the organizational culture as a whole needs to rethink, you know, it's it's learning paradigm yeah. to accept other options than the ones that we grew up with. And we, we see that as well, interestingly, in computer science. Uh, computer science, traditional computer science operated by what was called the waterfall method, uh, where you would design everything ahead of time, get all of your specs into a place, author the system, and then deploy. That's how they built Phoenix. Uh, no, they didn't even respect that. <laughs> yeah, okay. There was a few holes in the water. Well, there were a few. Yeah, there were a few holes in the. Well, that's the problem with the waterfall method, right? Yeah. If you didn't get it right in design, yeah, you're 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 sunk, uh, and and so, and this is this is not just true of our government service. This is true across the board, right? Um, uh, so in computer science, in computer science, uh, software development, an alternative methodology called Agile has been developed. And the Agile method is, you know, an iterative, try it out, test often, get feedback. Uh, you don't have, I mean, you have a roadmap, but you don't have a detailed plan. Um, and that's the same sort of thing with learning, right? Uh, and, and we're seeing this happen. Some people have talked about agile learning, which I think is taking it a bit too far, just in terms of metaphor, right? But, you know, the, this idea that you're mapping out ahead of time all the stuff you want to learn, um, all the stuff, you know, all the stuff you're going to have to do in order to get there, um, and then you start doing that, um, is less less, well, I, don't want, I want to say less effective, uh, is becoming less practiced, to keep this empirical, than an approach to learning where uh, you think of yourself as, as building capacities, um, you know, acquiring skills in order to address, uh, you know, not just short-term needs, but objectives, goals, etc., uh, and, and iterating. That was really badly expressed, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but I hope you get the idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you talked about the Cross Valley as one organization, and you were going to present the second one. Talked about, I'm sorry, the which? The Armed Forces. Oh, the Armed Forces. And then you had another one in mind. Yeah. Um, that I saw in your <laughs> you, you are absolutely correct. I, I'm thinking I didn't actually say that, but, but you're right. I did have another one in mind, and I wish I could remember it off the. Uh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> it went yeah. away. <laughs> no, there's um, well, there's there's a couple actually, and the problem is I don't have the references right handy in front of me, but. Um, Deloitte is one example, and IBM is another example. Both of these companies have moved from a former, uh, IBM is maybe a bad example <laughs> given, but anyhow. Um, <laughs> they've moved from a formal structured 
learning methodology to a much more socially based, informally based, community based learning methodology. Um, and, and it's again more focused on performance support rather than acquisition of competencies. Um, so I, I don't have all the details, but I do know that those examples exist and I can point to references, but not right now because I don't have them. So in your reflection um, and your research about skills and acquiring skills, what did you see or what do you think about the de-skilling that we also see? The, the no, there, there's different different versions of de-skilling. So are you talking about uh, de-skilling in the sense of a person moving from one type of employment to another? No, I'll, 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 I'll give the context. I, I used to manage the literacy portfolio. So some people who go through the rolling system right. and you know how to read and then okay. you lose it. So. And, and at work, if you don't use it, you lose it. And we tend to think we are in an, a period where we think that you acquire a skill when we hear, uh, even when we were with NRCAN, oh, we assessed you, you have the skill, then you're done for the rest of your career, you have it. And I'm yeah. like, well, it's... Yeah. Like that. So, de-skilling the references to, I forget who authored it, but the book, De-skilling Society. Um, no? Uh, anyhow, the, the, there is a book. A yeah. yeah, there is a book of that title which which talks mm -hmm. about that. I I have mixed feelings about that. Um, she's laughing because I always have mixed feelings about this. No, no, no. <laughs> because you said the skilling society. I said it's Trump by by Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's written by Donald yeah. Trump. <laughs> yeah, it's written by Donald Trump. There's yeah, so there, there's actually there's two separate issues at play here. And I, let's draw them out. There's the accidental de-skilling, and then there's the deliberate de-skilling. Um, I think the the Trump phenomena is a result of deliberate de-skilling, uh, which is a social and political phenomenon, which is probably outside the scope of this discussion. The accidental de-skilling is the one that you described, where if you don't lose, if you don't use it, you lose it. So, we know to a large degree that that's true. Even bicycle riding, they say you never forget how to ride a bicycle. That's not true. <laughs> you do. Um, in, in my case, the example is skating, right? I skated really well when I was younger, and then I didn't skate for 20 years. And I put some on just thinking, oh yeah, I'll just go for a quick. No. <laughs> it's, it's felt really bad. But even my great grandma was French from France. Yeah. And when she died, she didn't speak French. Yeah. So, there's the phenomenon of if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, which, as an aside, is why employees should be given the responsibility for creating solutions, solving problems, etc. Because if they don't have that responsibility, they'll lose that capacity. Um, the other side of that is, and this was observed as early as the 1960s by John Holt, people learn the skills that they need to learn. All right? We can say you need to learn math. What children in the class are learning, how to read the teacher to get the right answer. <laughs> right? Um, so if we are seeing evidence of de-skilling, that is evidence also of in a sense, a person not needing those skills because they're never using them, right? So you can all think of examples in your life. For example, trigonometry. How many still know it? I know it's part of the high school curriculum, and I know you all graduated high school, so you must have learned it. No? Yeah. Yeah? None of you know it right now. Uh, so, but... Do you need it? Is it a problem that you don't know it? No. Um, so that's the one side. 
until you have kids. <laughs> <laughs> until, until you, you have, have kids. Yeah. yeah. With homework. <laughs> yeah. But but then the excuse is, oh no, it's new math. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, like, then you learn how to pretend you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's called reading one chapter ahead of your kids. <laughs> Um, but the other side of it is, too, is people learn the skills that they need. What are the skills that they need? Well, if you all know how to work with this, mostly. You all know how to operate one of these. Um, you know, you're pretty good with policy developments, and, and I was also watching the interactions and all of that. And you're all experts at that, I noticed that, right? You learn the skills you need. But the thing is that, yes. Sometimes you don't know that there's something in there that you don't know how to use. Hmm. You don't need the users, yeah. but if you knew that it existed, you would actually be better. Yeah. Can you make a pencil? I know. Like, you don't know what you don't know in a sense. Yeah. And like, how many times like if somebody tells you something about Word or something or like, Word Perfect? But um, yep. That oh, I said oh, if I would have known that, and then you integrate it obviously with it, and I guess that's for sure. So when I was being introduced, I'll, I'll make this quick. Uh, I was introduced as curious, in, in the good sense, not the bad sense. Curious as in, I like to discover things as curious as in, he's hard. Um, <laughs> uh, although both are probably true. But curiosity is a skill. It's a skill that can be learned. If you really needed to know the things that you don't know that you don't know, then you would have learned how to discover them. All right? Actually, it turns out, yeah, there might be something on here that you would find really useful, but it's not such a big gap in your life that you have to spend the time figuring out how to discover these things. In my case, it is a big problem if I don't know, right? Over over the years, and and Don Donald Tapscott used to say, you know, this is what young people do all the time too. I'm not sure how true that was, but it's a skill that he observed, and it certainly is a skill. I open this thing up, or I open up MS Word or whatever, and I try every single command. I go through them methodically, right? From top to bottom, what does this do? Point. What does this do? Point. Now, I have ac accidentally uninstalled software doing that. <laughs> uh, you know, certain risks, right? But generally, generally it's pretty risk-free. I know Word really well because I have at least once executed every single command that Word allows you to ex execute. Right. I didn't read a book or anything like that, but I have the skill of exploring a software system, discovering what it can do. And then I try to break it, or I try to make it do something it can't do, or I try to use it to send a cat picture, or whatever. <laughs> right. And that's how I discover. It's not... You know, I mean, it's a kind of skill. And if you needed that skill, and I, I'll bet you dollars to donuts, you have that skill in other areas in your life. Uh, again, policy, right? Uh, how do you find the policy implications of something, right? You might not even know there are policy implications of something, but you have a responsibility to be able to find that out. You have the skill of navigating the, the labyrinth, uh, catching, you know, they're hooking on to sources, uh, you know, consulting who you need to consult, etc., and determining yes or no, there is an implication, here's what it is, or no, we're good, or whatever, right? That's the skill. You acquired that skill because you needed it. And it does seem like you were, you went through all that VA, there was like crowdsourcing, uh, learning with videos, right? So somebody, working on wings in India, we'll yep. do the short video of how they screwed that specific, like, screw. Yep. And then <laughs> screw that through it. That was better than screwing <laughs> that uh, nail, you know? <laughs> nail, yeah. Uh, but, but then that video would then be posted, and then somebody in Argentina would say, you know what, 
but if you do it back to it's going to go like 0.2 seconds faster again somebody would add on to there like, yeah and it, and i found that amazing in a way and that for me is like how do we bring this like yeah. to is that about motivation like, if I need to, I need to learn this, or if there is a usefulness for me, or for my organization to to be curious about this. Is that where that motivation sort of comes into play that you're speaking about, or that was spoken about? Earlier? But I guess it comes from motivation, also the intrusion, because if you don't really care, you won't actually look at the data. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I learn that way all the time. <laughs> I have another question, so if you can complete you can interrupt it. You talked about assessment and how you assess and this, the, the competency pay yeah. versus the I know I know that's a big dog. Um, I think it's very critical in terms of how we how we influence learning and how we manage staff and dealing with talent management issue. So in the past and not repeat it everywhere because but in the past, I participated as a manager in the EC program, developmental program for policy. Mm -hmm. And I was explaining to my director, I know what a good EC analyst is. I know it. I know when it works. I know when it's good. But with the set of competencies and the behaviors that they've mapped, I cannot tell the analyst why you don't deserve that promotion. Like, it, that, there was a a mismatch and I, I I was convinced it was because it was not well done so do you think it's possible to map out the behaviors and the the knowledge and learning and like no so no so what's next <laughs> <laughs> so that terrific question um, and that's exactly the problem they're facing in artificial intelligence now, right? Uh, good example. We have an artificial intelligence system. We feed it a whole pile of data about a person who's applying for a loan, and it comes back with this response. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. I added the laugh. But <laughs> An internal nasty laugh. <laughs> but, but, but the artificial intelligence denies the loan. And the question comes back, well, why? And strictly speaking, there is no answer, right? Because we, we input, you know, I don't know, 10,000 data points about this person. And that, that's why, you know, why we can't just say, you know, performing this job is these 12 competencies. Because correct performance of this job is 10,000 data points. Actually, it's probably more. Yeah. Uh, I'm underestimating, right? But that's all they fed the AI because, yeah, early days. Um, so, and that's a big problem in the ethics of artificial intelligence, which is a current debate happening now. Um, when an artificial intelligence does something that harms a person, we want an explanation for why that AI harms the person. And we expect that explanation to be something that we can understand, mm -hmm. not 100 pages of computer code. That doesn't help at all, right? We expect it to be, well, it thought the person would go left instead of right. And so it went right and oops, um, you know, something like that, right? Um, but those explanations are not forthcoming because that's not actually how the AI thinks. The AI doesn't actually think the person will go left and I should go right. It doesn't have those semantic categories uh, in it. It doesn't, it doesn't have the concept left, the concept right. It's working with a thousand data points and then it, it moves to something sub-symbolic. So the best answer that I've seen in the literature, and this is like contemporary this year, is the creation of counterfactuals. Right. Mm -hmm. So you, you test the counterfactual against the algorithm. So what you do is you create a scenario that is very similar to the scenario and you run it through the AI. Take the person who um, wanted the, the borrow the money, right? Uh, we have the same person, but we give them $200 extra a month and then apply it. 
the same person and we give them, um, you know, the fact that they did not go bankrupt three times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you conduct a set of these, right? And now it gives you a whole set of counterfactuals. Which one is the real one? And then, so what you do is you run an analysis on these different scenarios, a similarity analysis, because the logic of counterfactuals is based on the logic of the similarity of possible worlds. And squiggle, 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 reference, reference. Um, so you, you do an analysis, pick the possible world that is most similar in the most salient way possible to the existing world, and then the counterfactuals in that world that allowed you to get the loan, that constitutes the explanation. Well, we can discuss it later. <laughs> yeah, and I don't have an artificial intelligence to, to help. It's just a poor little that's natural intelligence. <laughs> that's but, but, that's, but, but if somebody asks you the question, the yeah. answer is counterfactuals. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you test counterfactuals, you pick the most likely ones, that's the explanation. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Merci beaucoup. Mm -hmm. J'espère que ça vous éclaire, ça vous donne une lumière. Je vois les beaux grands yeux, donc c'est magnifique. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Danz. I'm sorry for making you all an hour late. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> so, Euh, là, c'est présentement, ça va être l'heure du dîner, donc vous avez un petit 15 minutes pour vous rendre chez les vilains garçons. J'avais mes copains d'abord. Chez les vilains garçons.